NASA astronauts and SpaceX crew Dragon capsule are expected to splash down on Earth at any minute. This, of course, is following a two-month trip to the International Space Station. And it also marks the first water landing from space since 1975. Of course, weather has been a concern due to tropical storm Iasis. But NASA and SpaceX settled on this area, and it is an important area because it's actually not where the storm is expected. Let's also bring in Commander Chris Hatfield, former Canadian astronaut, former commander of the International Space Station himself. He joins us from Sarnia, Ontario. Thank you so much again for coming back. Uh, we're only minutes away right now. We just saw the control room, and maybe our control room can put this up again. What's it like for everybody in that control room? We were talking about the astronauts a few minutes ago. Let's get to the control room as well. Sure. So that control room you showed was uh, the SpaceX control room, which is uh, in sort of a suburb of Los Angeles in Hawthorne, California. And uh, oh, I had a chance okay. to be in there. And um, it's it's a, it looks like a bunch of people sitting at their desks, but they're all wearing headsets and they're listening to dozens of simultaneous conversations, listening to the weather loop from Florida to the search and rescue team, to NASA, to um, NORAD, to their own uh, experts who are sitting in other rooms. So it's this hotbed of mental activity. Doesn't look like much, you know, just to look people sitting there, but uh, maybe it's sort of like the crew in the spaceship. So long as things are going okay, people can just sit and think and do their jobs as necessary. But all those folks are super focused. This this is the real test today. This is human lives. This isn't just cargo. You know, if a cargo ship crashes, it's a waste of money. But it but it's not uh, a life. And mm -hmm. and today, Bob and Doug are in there. So that's that's what they're thinking about. The extra amped up concern about uh, trying to take care of those two astronauts. And and so that that's a really focused and busy group of, of people right there. Yeah, let me apologize. I called that the NASA headquarters. It's not. It's SpaceX headquarters there. Yeah, yeah. But they are talking to NASA. They are talking to Bob and Doug, who are coming down right now. We're only minutes away. Uh, talk about what it's like in these last few minutes. Uh, well, Bob and Doug are just, uh, I brought along my beautiful little spaceship simulator Ooh, here. Oh, it's nice. <laughs> um, but Bob and Doug just, just came into the atmosphere using friction to slow themselves down. And the vehicle was surrounded by flame. And not just flame, but actually like a, a, a sort of an energy level called plasma. And when you got a plasma field around your vehicle, you can't even communicate with the ground. Oh. So a lot of the people sitting in that Hawthorne room there in mission control, uh, they're, you know, kind of like just biting their nails because they can't even communicate with the vehicle or the people on board. But as it, the air slows it down, when it finally pops out the bottom, um, then they pop out a couple little drogue shoots that, that'll slow them down enough. Uh, so when they're about, uh, what, 20,000 feet above the ground or so, these, these drogue shoots will pop out. They're still going 350 miles an hour. That'll snap tight. And then once it slows them down to maybe 120 miles an hour, uh, American units, then they'll open four huge parachutes. And then it'll look a lot like, like a conventional skydiver, just somebody coming down under a parachute. And then hopefully all four of those parachutes, as Bob McDonald said, will open properly. And then uh, and they've tested them like crazy. Yeah. And th that'll be what, uh, what, what belly flops them into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, we had a chance to speak with Bob McDonald a bit earlier. I'm sure you know Bob McDonald from Quirks and Quarks. He was talking sure. about those four parachutes. He wants to watch to make sure all of them open. Is there ever a time that you've seen where those bigger parachutes, not the smaller ones, but the bigger ones didn't? Uh, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, when when I uh, flew, uh, I was the pilot of a Russian spaceship, a capsule that came back uh, on my third space flight. It just had one parachute. Oh. Um, so, so you were really hoping that it would open properly. We did have an, an emergency one inside. So if that one failed, we could cut the lines and then it would deploy the spe second complete separate parachute. But the design that SpaceX has gone with is because it's a bigger, heavier vehicle, they have four parachutes uh, all at the same time, like four big umbrellas next to each other. And they generate a certain amount of drag and lift. Of course, if there's only three of them, you get three quarters as much, so you'll come down significantly faster. Um, and you know, you wanna have at least two, uh, otherwise it's gonna be a pretty wicked slap into the ocean. Yes. Uh, but they tested it multiple times. In fact, it was one of the big 
big problems. And it looks like we're getting an image now of we maybe can see the it capsule. Now. Under, so that, that's good timing. It looks like the parachutes are are deploying. I think I see the two drag or drogue chutes, the ones that slow it down to deployment speed. And those, if I'm looking right, those would be the ones that then yank out the four big parachutes that will slow down uh, Bob and Doug to a speed that um, that then they're safe to enter the ocean. How fast are they going right now once those smaller parachutes have opened? Uh, as I think that's what we're looking at. But um, okay. They're, they're start, they're, if you just head the vehicle, it's going on the order of you know 350 miles an hour, whatever that is, 500 something kilometers an hour, pretty fast. But as soon as those two drogue shoots come out, oh yeah, they just released the drogue shoots. Here come the big ones. So they were they right now they were at uh, 120 miles an hour. So they just deployed these, and we can watch they they unreef. Uh, they have little um, sort of cables and things on them, so they don't just pop open and tear. They sort of help. Uh, open slowly, like like opening a pair or a, a, an umbrella in the wind, and I can count at least three. So so that's a good sign. I think I can see the fourth. Yeah, I can see all four. So that's, that's great good news. news. Super, super work to SpaceX engineers uh, and everybody that's been working with them. This means that they're now at a, at a decent enough speed. They'll they'll smack into the water hard, but. But uh, water is a lot softer than dirt. And, and yeah. uh, on, on my third flight, we, we landed on the on the ground, and it it oh. was a pretty rude awakening. Let's just listen in to NASA right now as the uh, capsule is coming in. See what they have to say. They just said two minutes to landing. We did miss that. Main chute descent rate nominal, passing through 700 meters. Great. So that's good that they're not saying anything. <laughs> that, yeah. At this point, Dragon that, has that saved all fine. propulsion systems on 600 board. 600 meters. 600 meters. And we're 600 meters above the Gulf of Mexico. So you heard how fast it went through approximately a minute 30 from splashdown. So fast. It, it, Mission it's Control like Team a, here in Hawthorne has reported the precise landing coordinates to the recovery team. They are standing by, ready to go get our space dads. That's wonderful to see. It's Think where that little ship was just a few hours ago and where it's been for the last two months. That's, that's a terrific bit of engineering. Great work, SpaceX. It's really exciting. I mean, I know we're just looking at it on the meters. screen here, but it's very exciting. One minute till splashdown. One minute to splashdown. 300 meters. We are brace for splashdown. Copy, brace for splashdown. One of the things you want to remember here is stop talking so you don't bite your tongue off as you hit the water. Reporting that they are bracing for a splashdown. Bracing for splashdown, good piece of advice. <laughs> we should be able also, to see. Also, you want to tuck your arms in. Gulf of Mexico here oh. in the shot just momentarily. As we're so now that just your arms about don't 20 flail meters around as you hit the ground. The ocean. Here we come. Splashdown. As you can see on your screen, we have visual confirmation for splashdown. Does that give you chills? It's just, it looks like it should be that way. It is almost a miracle that any group of human beings could organize themselves to make that happen so perfectly the very first time. That's one of the hardest engineering things we do as a species that we've ever done. And everybody just made it look like, like it couldn't have been any other way. Hats off to the engineers and people that have been working on this. And it's great to see the little rescue ship heading out there right now. Yeah, absolutely. And Bob, Oh, Bob and Doug are home. That's yeah, great. And they're home. And one of the interesting things, too, of course, this is a little bit different than maybe when it happened with you because of COVID. And the whole crew has been, um, it's been two weeks. I, I'm seeing about 40 staff, including doctors, nurses, uh, smaller boats. They have been uh, self-quarantined for two weeks and were tested for the coronavirus because of what's happening with the pandemic right now, too. And in that first on, boat, sorry, go ahead. It's on the flip side too, Hannah, in that um, 
a big part of the reason Bob and Doug flew in space was for the science involved, right. for understanding how things work. And the doctors are going to be really interested in their health and how their bodies readapt to coming back to Earth again. You sure wouldn't want to inadvertently give either of the two of them COVID. It would it would mess up a huge amount of research as well as threatening their lives. So we, we, we do take health super seriously in the space business. But with COVID as a threat, it, it's more serious than ever. So we see, uh, I'm told, and just from some research, or, uh, research that's been done, is a flight surgeon was going to be the first one to look into the capsule. Is that typical uh, during these? Um, when I've landed the space shuttle twice, uh, or you know, I was I was part of the crew. I didn't land it, but when mm -hmm. I was on board the space shuttle twice, you have a, a team that's right there, and uh, there's always a, a crew surgeon, a flight surgeon, someone who knows the crew, who they trust. In this case, because this vehicle's never landed with people on board before, there could be contaminated air because of the fuel that's on board it. Uh, the crew could be feeling pretty sick. So I think it's a really smart move to get a doctor in there first. Make sure the crew's healthy. That's the number one thing. And then the, the divers and the engineers and, and the safety technicians can, can do their jobs. Yeah, so just go through what happened. So it's now landed in the water. This is the first time in decades that we can see inside right now with the two astronauts. Um, yeah. What is it like getting out of this, well, for you, you know, out of a capsule like that. Well, one of the weirdest things, Hannah, is um, you've, you haven't had gravity going through your head for two months. So you've been weightless. You've been like Tinkerbell for two months, just flying <laughs> around everywhere. And now suddenly the, the gravitational field of the Earth is affecting their perception of everything. And if they tip their head to one side, it feels like their body's accelerating sideways. And if they tip their head back, it feels like they're doing somersaults because their inner ear doesn't know what to do with gravity. And so they coupled with that, they're inside a, a little, uh, you know, two men in a tub right now, bobbing around. And so it's a pretty, pretty trying on their inner ear. And when your body, thinks there's something wrong with your balance system, it makes you throw up pr pretty normally because it thinks maybe you, you swallowed a toxin or something. And so I hope the two of them are going to be okay, but it wouldn't be a big surprise at all if their bodies made them nauseous. How long does it usually take for your body to feel somewhat normal again? I know we were showing pictures earlier of you getting off and you could tell you were pretty weak, you weren't feeling so good, and that's understandable. How long does it typically take? Yeah, actually, I was 20% stronger when what? I came back from space than I was when I launched because I worked out every single day yeah. and, and, you know, no beer and pizza up there. So oh, yeah. I was in great shape, <laughs> but my balance system was shut down. And, you know, when you feel nauseous, how, how you feel, you know, you're all tottery and you don't feel well and you move very carefully. And that's the way they'll be. But within a day or two, they'll be able to walk around. NASA won't let them drive a car uh, for a couple weeks because their balance systems have to recalibrate again. Uh, and that's a smart move. When th they'll walk, you know, they w if they got pulled over, they wouldn't pass that sort of walk a straight line <laughs> test. But it's still, it's still, when you try and take a corner, you wobble. But also the We're reason that these two doctors- We're showing old pictures of you right now, yeah, if you can see that. I see them. The reason they're also carrying me is that that's that's Rafi from the Canadian Space Agency. They don't want me to fall, right. you know, and get hurt. So, it, you know, I was capable of walking, but I was also capable of falling. And so they're, they're just being careful and safe. And that's what everyone's going to be doing with Bob and Doug now also. It's, it's also just you've been in this beautiful, quiet, uh, isolated space station for 60 days. And now you're surrounded by wind and weather and noise and people and smells. And, and it's a little bit overwhelming just from that side as well. So the crew's got all that to deal with. But both of their uh, spouses are astronauts. Bob and Doug's yes. wives are both astronauts. So it's a really uh, unusual uh, homecoming for them. Uh, and for their, their two kids, you know, that, that's got to be a pretty amazing growing up to have everybody you know, all the parents are astronauts. And, and uh, Megan, who's, who's uh, Bob's wife, she just got assigned to a, a space flight, I think, six months from now. So, uh, so pr pretty different kind of homecoming from them than, than maybe your typical astronaut. Yeah, and you did some neat things when you're out in space. We remember your music for sure. This morning, was it this morning or is yesterday, Saturday night before they departed the International Space Station, Bob and Doug uh, did a recording for their young children, urging them to rise and shine. And we can't wait 
wait to see you. So kind of a nice moment there that many people wouldn't know about as well. Are there any moments like that for you that you kind of look back on and say, I'm so glad I did that? Oh, oh, thousands. But I think people ask me, well, people ask me all the time, when are normal people going to be able to fly in space? And that's, you know, it's like astronauts aren't normal people. I mean, we're <laughs> extremely technically trained. And we're, smart, we're very, very good very, very at a smart. certain number of things. But, but we're just folks, you know, and just like Bob and Doug, they're both super smart, capable people. Uh, I think Bob's got a PhD out of Caltech. You know, these are not slouches, but they also, you know, they got a living room and a backyard uh, to mow and, and got to take the garbage out and raise their kids just like everybody and go to the PTA meetings. And so it's really important that they not only be really good at what they're doing today, but also that, that they're good parents and spouses and, and they're, they're both good people. Uh, Bob was my next door neighbor for, for really? most of the time that I lived in Houston. Yeah, they we could we could see each other's houses where we lived in, a, in Clear Lake. That's very neat. So when you look at this, uh, I think we're seeing the pictures of the boat now arriving at the capsule. It's kind of hard to see because it is a low res uh, video downlink, but the boat's arriving. What's happening here? Do they have to do something outside before they can open the capsule? Uh, if you remember, when I don't know if you do or not, but when the space shuttle used to land, there were these vehicles that would drive out to the space shuttle right away, and they were like sniffers. They were making sure that there were no toxic gases coming off of the ship, because uh, you sure wouldn't want to uh, have the crew come out and then get a great big lung full of something that, that no one suspected might be there. So they're going to have a good inspection of the outside of the ship. They're also sampling the atmosphere. They're making sure it's a good place, and then they'll be able to... Uh, to I, th the plan was to lift up the whole capsule and set it on the ship, which is called Go Navigator, mm -hmm. um, rather than try and open a hatch there in the water because, you know, then if, if you get a leakage or, or a tip over, you can sink. So I, I imagine they're checking it all right now, getting set up so that they got the sling properly uh, established. You can see they've already let go of the parachutes, which will also get retrieved. And, uh, and they should be uh, grabbing it, hoisting it, putting on the ship, and then, uh, and then the crew could open the hatch and get out. We have about a minute left. Give me your final thoughts. What's next for space exploration? Uh, the moon is absolutely next. Mm -hmm. I work with several companies um, and, and with a, a Canadian tech incubator called the Creative Destruction Lab. We are looking uh, to take advantage of all the things we've invented to now not just visit the moon, but to actually make it part of, of the Earth moon system, just like Antarctica or any place it used to be unattainable. And that's where we are in history. And flights like this one today, this type of technology, that's what makes it possible. It's what's helping us through COVID but it's also what allows all the fascinating things of the future coming down the pike. And uh, what we just saw today, that's pretty good evidence. Pretty good evidence. We're very excited about it. We are excited to have you. Chris Hadfield in Sarnia, Ontario. Thank you, for, thank you for breaking this all down with us live right here on CBC News Network. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks.